Mr. Nelson. I apologize again. I promise I'll try to speed things up here again. So. So we'll just go off notes <laughs> instead of the PowerPoint. Before the break, we were talking about the controlled substances and the role that they uh, were, were, the levels that they were found in, the role that they may have applied or, or uh, contributed to Mr. Floyd's death. And I was suggesting to you that it is, again, this death needs to be looked at. Mr. Floyd's death needs to be looked at, as Dr. Baker describes, a multifactorial process. This is the way the human body works. The heart beats, the lung breathes, the blood circulates, the brain thinks, the brain controls all of our movements, right? All of this. And to simply come in and say, this particular substance, or these combinations of substances, when taken in con combination with each other, when taken in combination with a, of a person who has blockage in the heart, substantial, significant blockage in the heart, when we know that these drugs play a particular role in, the, in, in how the blood circulates, to just poo-poo it and say it has nothing to do with anything is just really a preposterous notion. Yet Dr. Baker, Dr. Fowler, and Dr. Thomas have all certified deaths at levels less than 11 nanograms per milliliter or 19 nanograms or combination, right? These deaths have been certified on that basis alone. And it didn't necessarily contain any of the other issues that were confronting Mr. Floyd on that day. Likewise, again, every other doctor that has testified has gone to great lengths to dismiss the role of Mr. Floyd's heart disease and hypertension in this case. Forensic pathologists define coronary artery disease resulting in death. It can, death can occur with 70 to 75% blockage. That is sufficient to cause the, a person's death. Every pathologist who testified in this case has indicated likewise that they have certified deaths with those types of blockage and attributed it to the coronary artery disease. Yet here again, this has played zero role. Dr. Rich testified Mr. Floyd had a healthy heart. Coronary heart disease, not relevant, according to the state. Hypertensive disease, not relevant. Drugs acting to further constrict an already heart, diseased heart, not relevant. Adrenaline coursing through Mr. Floyd's body, not relevant. What does adrenaline do? It further constricts the arteries, right? Adrenaline from the paraganglioma wasn't there, didn't happen, played no, no role. They just want you to ignore significant medical issues that presented to Mr. Floyd. And the failure of the state's experts to acknowledge any possibility, any possibility at all, 
that any of these other factors in any way contributed to Mr. Floyd's death defies medical science and it defies common sense and reason. Now, Dr. Tobin describes the death of Mr. Floyd essentially, as I understand again, to hypoxia, low oxygen resulting uh, in brain, going to the brain, low oxygen to the brain. Dr. Fowler also ascribes the death to hypoxic death, but that the heart was the, was the muscle that did not get the oxygen, resulting in a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. The reasons that Dr. Fowler dismissed the notion of brain hypoxia are because, number one, hypoxia of the brain results in certain observable symptoms. The brain demands more oxygen, right? It takes 20% of our oxygen to function the brain, even though it's one of the, it's, it's a smaller percentage of our body. It is the most sensitive to the loss of oxygen, and it reveals a progressive set of symptoms. Confusion, which was not exhibited, right? Because if you compare the if you compare the testimony about how whether Mr. Floyd was intoxicated, well, he didn't exhibit any confusion, right? Restlessness, not exhibited. Shortness of breath, it was complained of, but that is also a sensation that can be caused by a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. Visual changes, not complained of. Incoherent speaking, not complained of. When someone is experiencing hypoxia to the brain, as Dr. Tobin stated, you would see an increased ventilation or respiratory rate. But Dr. Tobin said it is a completely normal respiratory rate, 22 breaths per minute. The timeline in this case is consistent with a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. At 8.23 and 58 seconds, Mr. Floyd speaks. I really can't breathe. If you can speak, you have oxygen in your brain. At 8.24.09, he again verbalizes, please, I can't breathe, indicating at 8.24.09 that his brain has oxygen and there is no impairment to his airway. 39 seconds later, Mr. Floyd goes limp at 8, 24, and 48. A person can hold their breath for 39 seconds, right? That does not result in hypoxia in 39 seconds. 27 seconds later, according to Dr. Tobin, Mr. Floyd takes his last breath. It's a total of 66 seconds, one minute and six seconds, from the time that we know there's enough oxygen in his brain to speak, no occlusion to the airway at that point, 66 seconds to his, from his last word to his last breath. This timeline is consistent with a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. It is not consistent with the longer process of brain hypoxia. Dr. Fowler's final analysis was that Mr. Floyd died from a cardiac arrhythmia due to atherosclerotic and hypertensive cardiovascular disease during restraint by police. Other significant factors, fentanyl intoxication, methamphetamine intoxication, possible CO, carbon monoxide exposure, and the paraganglioma. What role did Mr. carbon monoxide play in Mr. Floyd's death? We don't know. No, nothing was ever tested as far as the vehicle is concerned. We don't know if the car was emitting carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. We don't know. One thing we do know is that it was running. And how can we tell that it was running? Because in the video we watched earlier, when Thomas Lane pulls in that squad car at Cup Foods, he puts it in gear, he takes it out of gear, he puts it in park, he never touches the keys of that vehicle, and he gets out. The car was running. I have one last point to make, and I should be fa fairly quick with this. The superseding cause that was discussed. A superseding cause is, an, is a cause that comes after the defendant's acts, 
alters the natural sequence of events and is the sole cause of a result that would not have otherwise occurred. Now, let's look at the medical timeline here. We know that EMS was called initially at code 2 at 8, 20, and 11 seconds. We know that EMS was stepped up to code 3 at 8, 21, and 35 seconds. We know that EMS responded to Cub Foods based on uh, the videos at 8, 27, and 27 seconds. We know that EMS called for fire at 20, 38, 36. It takes approximately three minutes for EMS and the arresting officers to put Mr. Floyd into the ambulance and the ambulance pulls away from Cup Foods at 8, 30, and 17 seconds. Fire responds to Cup Foods at 8, 32, 59. That's four minutes and 15 seconds after they were called. That's pretty close in consideration to the three minute expectation of Miss Hansen. But the ambulance had driven several blocks away to 36 in Park, arriving sometime between 831 and 833. That's one and a half, and we know that because there are two exhibits, 62 and 63 that were introduced. 62 shows one paramedic and officer laying in the back 63 shows two paramedics and officer laying in the back. So somewhere between a minute and a half to three minutes to get to 36 and Park where they began the resuscitative efforts. The first air is pumped into Mr. Floyd per Dr. Tobin at 2035.06. That is 10 minutes after Mr. Floyd went unconscious per Dr. Tobin, but it is seven minutes and 46 seconds after EMS responded to cut foods. We ultimately know that the ambulance left uh, 36 and Park at 8.48 and 23 minutes. It arrived at HCMC at 8.53, shortly after 8.53. So it took about five minutes to get from 36 and Park to HCMC. What if you what would have happened if EMS had started resuscitative efforts right away? What would have happened if rather than driving to 36 and Park, they went to the hospital? They would have been there in that time. I am not suggesting to you, I am not suggesting to you that the ambulance paramedics did anything wrong. But it raises the prospect of that continued delay in resuscitation. What if EMS had administered Narcan? We heard that it would not have hurt him and it could have helped him. I'm not blaming the paramedics. More importantly than this analysis, in this analysis is, it shows that human beings make decisions in highly stressful situations that they believe to be right in the very moment it is occurring. There's lots of what ifs that could have happened, what could have happened, what should have happened. Lots of them in lots of regards. But we have to analyze this case from the perspective of a reasonable police officer at the precise moment with the totality of the circumstances when it comes to the use of force. We have to look at the cause of death to determine, did Mr. Floyd die exclusively of asphyxia or were there other contributing factors that were not the natural result of Mr. Chauvin's acts? Right? Things that happened that were set in motion before Mr. Chauvin ever arrived. The drug ingestion, right? the bad heart, the diseased heart, the hypertension. All of these things existed before Mr. Chauvin arrived. The struggle. What role did the struggle play? We know, based on a prior incident, that Mr. Floyd's heart was beating at 219 over 160 in a, in a situation where he was confronted by police and had ingested drugs. 
He didn't die that day. All of this, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, all of this, when you take into consideration the presumption of innocence, the presumption of innocence and proof beyond a reasonable doubt, I would submit to you that it is nonsense to suggest that none of these other factors had any, any role. That is not reasonable. And when you, as members of the jury, conclude your analysis of the evidence, when you review the entirety of the evidence, when you review the, the law as written, and you conclude it all within this, all within a, a thorough, honest analysis, the state has failed to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. And therefore, Mr. Chauvin should be found not guilty of all counts.